All right. Uh, good afternoon. I hope this is coming through. Um, this Welcome to this session of NARCON 2022. Workout session is going to be parachute duration. So I'm going to start off with a slide deck. Uh, I'm going to rip through some slides here, and I am going to then switch to a live demonstration. I'll try to show you a little bit of show and tell about the materials and techniques I'm talking about, as well as uh, show you a bit of a packing demo. Back out in the lobby, uh, when you chose this event, you should have found an attachment you can download. Uh, it has some sources. It has some of my thoughts on parachute duration and on competition in general. I've provided that for you as a supplement to this. If you're watching through Excel events this weekend, you'll get that um, a month down the road when this gets posted up to the NARS YouTube channel, that won't be available. I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing that for you now. And we're gonna talk about uh, this in the context, uh, a number of contexts. I, of course, was asked to do this for new competitors. Um, whether you would like to try it out for the NRC and get your name up on the national scoreboard this year, or if you're excited about trying out for the next United States team that will be competing at the World Championships in Texas in 2023, I'm hoping that the information I give you today will be helpful for you. Um, for myself, I was into competition model rocketry quite a ways before I figured out parachute duration. And it wasn't until uh, 2011 that I started to really work out the, the kinks and the bugs. It had been my Achilles heel before then, and I had wildly inconsistent results. So this is not necessarily just for new people. Um, I think parachute duration and streamer duration are considered to be beginner's events uh, because we're familiar with those uh, recovery methods, right? So you have a discipline, you have the disciplines of altitude in competition, you have craftsmanship, which involves scale and other things like that. And then you have the duration events where the event is described and defined by the, the method of recovery. So you have glide recovery, helicopter recovery, and in this case, parachute and streamer recovery. So when you start out with your first model, whether you started out with an easy uh, model as a kid, a sport model, um, or you came into model or sport rocketry through high power, it's very likely that one of the very first models you built was recovered by parachute. So we consider these to be beginner events. Um, parachute is considered to be an entry level event, but it's kind of like knowing how the chess pieces move and being a grandmaster. There's a, there's a gulf there, there's a gap in knowledge that takes some time to work out. Now, um, I really recommend that you go get help. Um, R.org now has some really great resources uh, down the left side of the um, menu, uh, you'll find a competition section. That open up, opens up a whole world for you. There are descriptions of the NAR event or descriptions of the international events. Uh, that's where you'll find the national scoreboard to see how people are doing this year in this competition year. Uh, that's where you'll find the national records to see what the, uh, the goals, if you wanna try out for a new record or try to, to break a new record, it'll show you how high um, For myself, I got help through local competitors and uh, competitors, competitors at a distance that were willing to be mentors. Um, I never would have made it on my first United States team as a PD competitor if it hadn't been for Todd Schwime and George Gasway and Ed LaCroix. And to some extent, um, also my team member at the time, Ryan Wolkenberg, those men, um, they provided sounding boards. They looked at my models and said, you need to fix that. Or they showed me and, and loaned me parts. It gave me parts and said, try this instead. So getting help from somebody who's local would be a great, great way to get ahead in competition. Of course, there are online resources. You can use Google or search engines or whatever. But NAR.org and finding a, an excited modeler near you is really the way to go. Competitors love to talk about it. We're kind of hobby, um, but it's kind of like uh, the difference in motorsports between NASCAR, F1, and uh, drag racing. Um, you, you get a hold of somebody who's into that and they'll talk for hours about it. And us competitors are the same way. So we love to talk about and help uh, new competitors. Um, there's a tendency when you first think about maybe I want to try competition to think about how you'll sit down and design the next model that will set the world on fire or a new approach to something. But to begin developing success, I really urge you to copy something that's success, that is successful. Uh, go back in the old rocketry magazines or go to NAR.org and find successful designs and copy those to get started. Uh, maybe you want to use some kits and slightly modify them, something that's on the market. I have some uh, suggestions for you in that supplement document. Work on perfecting your practice. And this is about not dumb repetition and just burning motors, 
but uh, really seek to refine your processes so that you get better and better at an event. Uh, my personal feeling is that a mediocre model flown by a really skilled modeler who's got a lot of practice in uh, really stands a chance against an expensive um, super Dynawapen carbon fiber great model that's uh, brought to a contest by somebody who didn't practice and doesn't have the chops to put it all together and be successful. You learn to compete by getting in the ring. So every time I go to a competition, I'm putting myself under a little bit of stress and you learn to compete by getting in there. Um, you go make some mistakes, but you also uh, arrive at the competition with your model, your range box and what you've got in here. You got your brains and you problem solve and being forced to problem solve at a contest makes you such a better modeler. Um, so we're gonna talk specifically about parachute duration. If you go to the NAR website, you'll find um, suggestions and comments that may disagree with what I have today. These are the things that work for me. One of the things that I agree with uh, that's been posted up on our website is that you have to use thin light material for parachute duration. You want um, mylar, quarter mil mylar or HDB, HDPE. This is high density polyethylene plastic. I'm gonna show you some examples of that in a bit. These materials can be packed very um, tightly or they can be put in uh, compact uh, packages to be folded up and put in your model and they have really proven themselves. The top of the podium at the World Championships almost was somebody, almost always is somebody flying quarter mil mylar. Um, for myself, I choke at the price of it, and I like to do a lot of practice flying, so I fly the high density polyethylene. We're gonna look at how to make custom shoots in a bit, uh, but these are the two um, materials that you wanna make them out of. Um, my personal rule, bigger is better. If you think about it, you want to get the biggest parachute and the smallest, lightest uh, model that you can. There's kind of a sweet spot. You can make a small model but not have room for very much parachute. You make a great big model that doesn't boost very high and get a great big chute. Somewhere there is a sweet spot of the smallest loading on the parachute, the fewest ounces per square foot, the smallest number of grams per square meter. Um, there's a really interesting R&D report done by the late, late Ducky Clouser for NARAM 40. When he was designing for quarter A PD or quarter A parachute duration, he put together his R&D report. If you look at the model he chose to compete with, it actually is in that sweet spot. It's the lightest, fewest number of grams per square meter of parachute area. So you want a nice big chute. You want to, to work out what the biggest thing is you can fly in the model that you're going to work with or you're going to fly. One of my rules is that more shroud lines is better. Dave uh, Jr. Uh, to try okay. little hexagon parachutes we know model optimum form. I like to use 12 to uh, parachute with it's up until a pair in diameter. I build over a mirror and I don't flat sheet not true hemisphere. Um, I don't like a lot of waste material flapping in the wind lines. So uh, the bigger the parish shroud this 12, I can see a reason to use shroud lines. Um, only 12 is better. It's a lot to work with and take some practice. Um, I understand my uh, internet is cutting out. I'm going to uh, try to get the rest of the family off the internet. All right, I'll do what I can. So um, there is a magic ratio, and I think this is borne out in past research and development reports, that the length of your shroud line should be about one and a half times the diameter of your parachute. Uh, that's been my experience. It's what I stick with. Um, it's what I recommend. There is a tendency to uh, allow the model to hang farther away from the canopy. This reduces the swinging or the circular oscillation. Anytime your model is swinging back and forth under the parachute, it's spilling air. And that's the opposite of what we want in a duration event. We want hang time. We want to be in the air as long as possible. So a uh, nice long shroud line. You see from the picture, I hope that shows up well. 
um, my model and my nose cone are all the way down at the end of the shock cord. They're as far away from the parachute as they can be. But uh, I really think that when you're packing your parachute, when you're building your parachute, cleanliness, uh, you want a clean, dry environment. Yeah. So I recommend to pack the parachutes ahead the day before, before the before the uh, recently in getting ready for this talk today. I flew a parachute that was in the model packed at least five and maybe six years ago. It was all prepped, so I didn't take it apart. I left it packed, went to the um, park and flew it, flew great. Uh, when using the Mylar and high density polyethylene materials, um, I have really good success. I've, I've flown models that have been packed for a year, uh, no, no, no issues getting the chute to open. Um, the worst thing you can do is get your parachute wet or dirty. Um, if you are in the summertime at like a championship, you don't want to get sweat, sunblock, or a combination of sweaty fingertips and exhaust residue from your launch pad or from your model uh, on your parachute canopy. The thin materials get glued together, whether it's capillary action, surface tension, I don't know the correct technical term, but it binds it all up and they will not come apart. The worst thing you could do is lay down or kneel down in uh, grass at the field, even the grass that feels dry to the touch, because the moisture will stick that parachute together. It's almost always a guaranteed failure. Um, I'll try to get on a table if I have to pack at the field. Again, I don't like to pack at the field. If I have to pack a parachute, um, I've done it in the trunk, uh, the back seat of a rental car. I feel sorry for whoever had to clean the talcum powder out of the back seat. But uh, you want to get into a clean, dry area away from the wind as best as you can. So. Uh, those are thoughts on that. This is a little bit of a side note on that. Um, if you're flying for the U.S. team um, at the World Championships, you'll have to fly three rounds with two models. So one of those models has to come back and either have a parachute repacked and reinserted or a new parachute has to be loaded. Uh, the uh, general consensus is to have a parachute already loaded in a body tube or in a spare model. You don't get to fly a third model, but you can just transfer that already folded and packed parachute into your model and get a flight in. Um, you'll see in kind of the right edge of the photograph there, uh, previous round model was re recovered. Uh, that was one of my models recovered by a US team member. That model had gone over pastures in the, uh, the Alpine pastures and meadows in Slovakia and it had been retrieved over streams and fences and things. And so the very large delicate parachute came back a tangled mess. That's not their fault. Um, even if you can't have the third parachute prepped or an extra parachute prepped and in a body tube, having a clean brand new parachute, a spare parachute in a bag or in a tube or, or somewhere nearby that you can pack and prep and not have to worry about untangling an old one. I'm going to show you how to make parachutes today and they're going to be fairly fragile. Now I get a lot of use out of them if I get them recovered. If they don't thermal away and I don't lose those parachutes, I'm able to get them back up just takes time untangling them, straightening them out at home later uh, at the field that's very difficult to do. So at least have a backup parachute if you can't have one that's ready to go. Now, part of uh, flying PD is a lot like learning to fly a contest or learning to be a competitor. You need to develop a process. So I said back in 2011, when my parachute performance stuck, um, by taking tips from other competitors and carefully examining my failures, I developed a packing and folding process. And by repeating that over and over, that became successful. And that's what I'm gonna share with you. Nothing I'm saying today is an absolute gospel truth. These are my opinions and they're the things that have worked for me. So I wanna stress that um, I'm sharing with you what has worked for me as I've developed and distilled the process. One of the craziest things I've ever seen was someone repeat failure. Um, I watched an adult, uh, at a contest, uh, randomly cram a parachute in a model. They launched the model. The plastic wad did not recover the model safely. They repaired the model and they randomly crammed the parachute back in again. It was a real eye-opener for myself. Uh, one thing my teammates have always stressed is document, uh, log your successes and log your failures both and try to work out those failures. So try not to repeat a failure without changing something. So if you get a tangled parachute or a wadded parachute, you want to try to iron that out, find out why it did, change one thing and make a note of it and try it again. 
I prefer to fly as much as time and money allows. Again, I really think that having parachutes deploy successfully every time is what's key for this event. So that means if I'm preparing for a parachute duration, which is our NRC event, or for the US team, which flies a, a PD uh, or S3A, at the uh, national international level, um, I'm going to try to get out there and fly a lot with quarter A or half A motors. The important thing isn't the height of my boosts. It's do I get a reliable parachute every time? I like to build five or six of the same model. Um, for instance, I'll pack all those parachutes, prep those models on a Friday night and go to the park on Saturday morning or go to a club launch and just launch them one, two, three, four, five. If I've got five models that I've got in rotation that way, I want to keep refining my process until I get five out of five parachutes every time. So they need to be, whether I'm flying those on quarter A's or half A's for easy recoveries. I like quarter A's, uh, to be honest, for a parachute duration because it deploys at such a low altitude, I can see the whole thing unravel. I can see the parachute come out, unfold, inflate, uh, and I don't have a long ways to walk to recover it. And I get to do it again. So I buy a bunch of packs of quarter A motors when I prepare for a parachute duration. And that's what I would recommend this year for uh, the NRC and for the pr practicing for the team tryouts. Um, to find materials to make your own parachutes, uh, there are quarter mil parachute kits available. Um, ASP is a great way to get them. Um, I believe Apogee also sells them and they may be resales of the uh, ASP uh, parachute kit. I'm not sure, I think that's true. They're called hang time uh, parachutes. Now uh, they come in a variety of sizes. Um, I fly a lot of my APD and a lot of my FAI with 36 inch parachutes. In quarter mil Mylar, a parachute kit like that's gonna regularly cost between nine and 15 bucks, 10 to 15 bucks a parachute. Um, because I like to fly a lot and my parachutes do take a beating, that, that begins to get a little bit difficult to justify cost-wise for myself. Now that may not be a problem for you. Um, you can make parachutes yourself. If you don't want to buy a kit, you can buy the Mylar material from ASP. You can also buy pre-cut canopies and make your own. Um, what I do is I go cheap. Um, I buy a roll of high density polyethylene at a big box store like Lowe's or Home Depot. Specifically, it's called out as 0 0.031 mil uh, material. Usually comes in a 900 or a nine foot by 400 foot roll or a 12 foot by 400 foot roll in a box. Depending on which size you buy, that's usually $25 to $32 per box, and you get a, more than 100 parachutes out of a box. Um, it's meant to be cheap disposable overspray protectant or dust protectant stuff. It's not a heavy-duty drop cloth like you would um, want to stand on it. You wouldn't tarp up something with it when you're going to the dump. It's, it's really light, thin material. Um, to make my shroud lines, even if I purchase a, a parachute kit, um, I really like to use shroud lines that are thin nylon. And uh, the parachute shroud line material that I like the most is no longer available. Um, so the best thing I have found that is available is a size nylon rod wrapping thread. Now this is made by people who make custom fishing rods. So uh, mudhole.com has a, a website that I have done business with and found a, a very good response from them. Um, a size is the thinnest. They also sell a B size that's slightly thicker. Um, you want to make sure that you don't get UV stabilizers. I've purchased both kinds of thread. They look identical almost side by side, but something about the UV stabilization to color proof those threads makes them tangle and snag like mad. Uh, you'll want to pull every hair out of your head and scream every obscenity you know should you end up with the UV, UV stabilized thread. Um, but if you're interested in just trying out parachute duration, you can get a hundred yard spool. I'll show you one of those in a moment. Um, about four bucks, a little bit less than $4. If you really want to go all in and commit to parachute duration, uh, the way I have for FAI over the years, I've, uh, I went ahead and bought the four ounce spool, which is 4,800 yards of thread on the A size. It's, it's less as you go bigger. So the um, thicker threads would be B and D size. They do sell a D size thread. I'll show you some of that too. That's not bad for sport flying, um, but uh, B size is kind of a nice, uh, compromise if you don't want to go. A size is really thin stuff. It's not miserable to work with, but it is a very thin shroud line. Um, I attach my shroud lines to the canopy using half inch wide aluminized mylar tape. Uh, again, good old 
Asp Rocketry um, comes through and uh, I buy it there or I buy it from online sources. I've bought it from various places. Um, I know I can get it from ASP. Uh, so I get about a thousand parachutes out of a roll because I'm using a little tiny tab of tape. You'll see that again. Downside of using high density polyethylene, uh, it is cheap, but it has no color. It is a clear translucent material and doesn't show up well against the sky. Mylar being aluminized, it looks like a mirror. You'll, I'll show you that in a moment as well. It's very visible in all except for solid overcast conditions. But even cloudy skies, Mylar tends to look pretty good. HDPE disappears. Uh, and so what you have to do is put some color on that. The way to do that is with a, a big Sharpie Magnum marker. Um, those have a half inch by quarter inch chisel tip. Um, they lay down a heavy black or red. Uh, the downside of those is that they are extremely smelly. Uh, they have a lot of xylene or other things in them. Uh, in experimenting for this presentation, I tried to use just bottled alcohol ink. Um, a lot of people don't know, but markers can be refilled. Back in uh, 40 years ago when I was getting started as a, a draftsman and uh, doing graphic design kind of stuff, uh, designers used to refill markers. And it never occurred to me till just this year that I could have been buying the bottled ink for refilling markers. Often a marker, uh, the ink is exhausted while the tip and the barrel is still fine. Um, Blick or Dick Blick at Blick.com, I think, uh, is a national uh, art supply chain. They have a store brand of marker ink that I started trying out. The great thing is rather than sit there and draw half inch wide strips as you do with a Sharpie, you can pour a little ink out, a few drops of it, smear it around with a alcohol pad that's been dampened with alcohol. It covers the parachute extremely quickly, um, has a little alcohol, but no xylene, uh, no harmful fumes, and it dries better. The Sharpie tends to stay a little sticky, but the Dick uh, Blick inks do not. I've also started experimenting with some others. There's a another local chain of art supply stores. And I started trying a Ranger and Jacquard and a number of other little inks and I'm experimenting with those. Um, they color pretty well. They're not quite as intense as a Sharpie, but they are a nice compromise without stinking up the place. So let's build a 12 sided parachute. Um, you're gonna take your canopy material. Um, I'm gonna pretend that you have a random size sheet as though you had built or, bought or purchased plastic in a box or in a roll and you're cutting off a piece. Um, rather than having a pre-cut canopy. Get your shroud line material. The key here for a 12-sided shoot is having a 30-degree triangle, uh, and then you'll need a straight edge and a ruler and something to color your um, canopy with. We start out by just making a simple four-layer uh, four, four fold. So we fold from left to right, top to bottom, and we should have a corner that we can identify that would be the center of our sheet. By positioning a big 30 uh, degree triangle on this, I split that 90 degree angle into thirds. And so you can kind of slide that and position it back and forth until the sides overlap evenly and then slide the triangle out. Measure down an equal distance on the sides from the apex and then just snip it off. Uh, I like to make a bunch of canopies at a time. So I mark the sizes of my canopies. Um, this was some pink trash bag material. It's probably half mil, not really good for competition, but nice for practicing or for sport models. So this was a 25 inch parachute that has 12 lines and 0% spill hole. I'm not gonna go into spill holes. Um, I do fly competition with spill holes in a lot of my parachutes. I urge you to read the R&D report. If you're a NAR member, you can find that on, free online at nar.org. There is uh, an R&D report by the late Wally Etzel from NARAM 39. And uh, um, Wally was a friend of mine here, uh, was a, a brilliant engineer and a wonderful modeler who experimented with lots of new things. Um, so I, I mark my canopies out. Now, um, adding color, these are examples of the clear HDPE material that has been marked up with Sharpie. Um, the parachute on your left is the parachute that was packed for at least five years before I flew it. Um, that's a, about a 24 inch parachute or so, maybe it's a little larger. Uh, when it deployed, I was surprised. I didn't know how old the parachute was until it opened up and I realized it had very little color. Um, this is only about 50% color coverage. Now flown the same day is the parachute in the right-hand photo. And that is uh, a larger chute, but with 75% color coverage. And so to get good contrast with the sky, which is what you're after, you will need to add plenty of color. 50% is about the minimum I think you can get away with. At least that's my experience. Um, if you choose to use the Sharpie, like I said, it stays tacky. These are photos of them hung up in my shop trying to dry. 
and the red Sharpie marker can remain tacky after even several days. Now, I live in a really dry Arizona, Arizona environment, and my markers tend to dry pretty quick, but that stuff doesn't. You can knock that down with talc, but I don't like to talc my canopies until I have my shroud lines attached. So um, you'll have to find what works for you. Um, I'm liking the alcohol inks a little bit combined with black Sharpie. The black Sharpie is nice and dense, but the alcohol inks, I can color up an area without a lot of tackiness. Um, consider when you're making your parachutes, what uh, conditions you'll be flying in. Uh, in Arizona, I can often be pretty, you know, 300 or better days a year, be assured that I'm going to be flying in a nice blue sky. So I can get away with a lot of bright colors. Now, if I go anywhere else and any, any other day of the year, I might have a sky that's mixed of clouds or haze or fog or what, what have you. And so bold, dark colors work really well. Mylar is good in almost every condition because of the reflective surface. It looks like a mirror. The upper surface reflects the sunlight, sparkles in the sun. The underside, because it is so opaque, shadowed area. And so it stays dark. And so there's a lot of contrast. If the whole sky is uniformly gray, um, even mylar can be tough to see at a distance, but everybody will be in the same boat at the competition when you come down to that. But we want to put our shroud lines onto the chute. Um, we're going to cut 12 lines that are one and a half times the diameter of the chute. I don't like looping lines from point to point because the, the lines can't untangle or into personal preference. Um, I have examples in the left photo of three shroud lines. I have the white line, which is a sport uh, shroud line that came with a, some sport kit that I have. It's fuzzy, cotton, uh, it's thick. Um, not what I would prefer, not what, would, what I would recommend for competition. The center line is the rod wrapping thread in the D size nylon. And you can see that it's a little thicker than the yellow one, which is the A. Now, most people telling you to make parachutes say tie a loop in the end, punch a hole and tie your shroud line to the chute or do something uh, in order to help anchor that line to the canopy. I realized I was using nylon and nylon melts when it's hot. So I cut my shroud lines and then just hold the end of the nylon close to a flame, not in it, it will burn very quickly, uh, but I melt a little bead on the end of my line and then I can tape it onto my chute. So I take the half inch wide mylar and I lay it out on backing paper. Um, in this case, the back of a sticker or the back of some sort of release paper from some, some other kind of tape perhaps, and then cut it down into strips. When I started making my parachutes for competition, uh, you'll see in the center photo that I was using half inch squares. I was nervous about a tiny tab of tape um, holding my model. It's my precious model. I want to win this competition. I realized after a couple of years that that was way overkill. Um, I just needed a quarter inch by half inch tab of tape. And that's what you see in the right hand photo. You see uh, the backside of a clear parachute after I have put the shroud line on and burnished it down with my thumb. So that's what I recommend. You stick all your shroud lines on, make sure you press them well down from the other side with a soft eraser um, or a fleshy fingertip. And uh, mylar and high density polyethylene both will conform very well and they'll really grip. And having a little bead or not uh, secures that and keeps that from pulling loose. I've never had a shroud line pop off um, in the last 11 years since I started flying parachute duration. I then gather my shroud lines up and tie a uh, nice fat double knot in the end. And before I cinch that down tight, I put a little drop of glue on there. So when I pull it down, the glue gets uh, drawn into the knot. And then to attach it to the model, I simply put a slip knot in the end of my 28 pound Kevlar and then bite down uh, on the shroud lines right ahead of the knot. I don't use snap swivels. I don't use rings. I don't use barrel swivels. Um, I don't have things rotating. So I don't know why I would need a swivel and the extra um, weight there. So I just don't. Um, you can always loosen up the slip knot, pop the parachute out, put another one on. So that's that's my recommendation. That's what I do. Um, to practice a lot, um, these are all FAI legal models. The center one looks like a big Bertha because it uh, sort of is. Um, these fly on A83 motors or A85s. Um, they all weigh about 30 grams. And I can put, um, you know, one meter, uh, 40, 44, 48 inch parachutes in there and fly pretty cheap. They're a lot of fun. Um, personal preference here, uh, a lot of competitors in PD like to see their model hang vertically. Uh, they have their shroud line internal, or their shock cord rather, I'm sorry about that. Shock cord is internal to the model, 
and they want the model to fall down vertically and snap that parachute open. I go for the extra drag of having an externally mounted shock cord, and I'm also often using the 28 pound Kevlar. It doesn't take ejection charge heat very well, it's so thin. So I have my shock cord on the outside of the model and using a, an expended engine casing, I hang the model, uh, I get the model hanging horizontally below the parachute and allow the nose cone to um, slip down to the end. It may be uh, laughable to think about practicing a high performance event uh, with a, a big Bertha, but um, the model in the center on its first flight on an A85 uh, had over a six minute flight and then hung on a power line for a week before some club members got it back. It's good for about a minute uh, to two minutes in dead air with a nice sized parachute. So again, if I'm practicing packing parachutes and not altitude, these are, these are pretty um, accessible. I'm provided you with a wall of text here. It may be too much to read. This is in the document that you can download. These are some common failures that I ran up against and my thoughts about curing them. Um, line over the top, usually is because shroud line is packed inside the rocket with and not inside the parachute. You gotta remember your parachute's gonna be this nice plastic package. Um, so if you hide your shroud lines inside, that plastic package gets to exit the model and it's the friction between the outside of the parachute package and the inside of the body tube is what tends to drag shroud lines all different ways. Um, one thing that I learned quickly was to avoid bird nest type failures is for lack of a better term. Um, if you put your parachute in the model and then pack a bunch of coils of shock cord and shroud line and everything else on top of it, when the ejection charge fires, it has to fire that parachute out through that bird's nest. And that's where all kinds of things tangle. So my rule personally is have the shock cord and everything else beside or behind the parachute in the model. There's nothing between my parachute and the outside air except for that nose cone. The nose cone is gonna get blown out of the way really quickly and then the parachute can open. Other things are the things that you would expect if you're burning or burning lines and melting canopies, you either need to use more wadding or switch to foam plugs for ejection. Um, if your canopy is getting stuck shut, you either have uh, tacky ink on there that needs talcum powder applied to it, or you had dirty wet hands or a, a speck of moisture that got up on the canopy when you were folding it and, and packing it. Um, those are kind of big things. Um, the old sport um, way of packing a parachute where you wrap or roll lines around the outside is an absolute no-go for competition. Um, if you roll very carefully the lines around the outside of your folded canopy so that they don't twist, the airflow is not going to know that you did that and it will not know to unroll your canopy nicely. Instead, it's gonna pull the lines off one end of that folded parachute bundle and it's gonna incorporate twist. So we're gonna stop now and go look at some uh, show and tell and I'm gonna to try to pack or fold a parachute for you live. I'm gonna hope it goes smoothly. Uh, this last photo is from Narum 60, uh, 56 in Pueblo. It was a very overcast, gray, uh, wet day to fly parachute duration. And I was trying to get a picture of my model, the one with the red and black parachute. And I just happened to catch, unfortunately, a hapless junior competitor's model as it streamered in, um, talking to the kid. They had used a wet canopy and they had rolled their, their shroud lines up. And sure enough, it all rolled up into a twisted uh, bundle and came in. So we want to get you from the uh, the bad picture here into the good good picture. And so um, let's go, and I'm going to switch back to my camera. I'm going to try to stop sharing, and um, we're going to flip down to look at my work surface. Hopefully, this will all go smoothly. When we're talking about low-density polyethylene, high-density polyethylene, uh, the thing you want to avoid is low-density polyethylene. When you go to find um, the stuff, it's kind of very nice, very great, for, bad for competition. Cleaner bad is also low-density polyethylene. Polyethylene are very similar to density polyethylene. But this low density polyethylene has a different structure. Lower melting point, undesirable, and behave quite the same. So we're going to look, um, don't like 
find it to be as good, we're going to look for something that is high density polyethylene. This is also the stuff that most trash bags, Ziploc sandwich bags kind of thing. That's, this is, that's all low density polyethylene. Again, nice for sport models, not so great for, for competition. You know what high density polyethylene looks like. You've seen it at the grocery store. It's the same chemical, but a slightly different structure. From my understanding, this has a more crystalline structure. Um, it has a brittler, a brittler, cracklier kind of finish to it. Um, a really nice thin source of it is the grocery or the uh, produce section. If you were to build a small comp really thin produce bag, um, and here is one, a, a, a canopy cut from produce bag, but the biggest canopy I can get is about 16 inches across. But this is what high density polyethylene looks like. It's got that crackly finish. You may hear it on the microphone. I don't know if it's picking that up, but it's available in big sheets or rolls and it's called HDPE. Again, I mentioned the king of them all and that is Mylar. This is a quarter mil aluminized Mylar. Um, again, available either pre-cut or in bulk. Uh, Mylar has a really high melting point. It has zero stretch. High density polyethylene has a relatively lower melting point, but it has a lot of stretch. Mylar will want to tear before it stretches. High density polyethylene will want to stretch before it tears. So those are things to think about. Um, they tend to be fragile in that uh, if you nick the edge of your mylar, that will propagate into a tear, which can really make a, a mess or, or disqualify you when flying PD. So those are things to think about. Um, again, nice thing about making your own parachutes from different materials is that you get to choose what size they are. If you can fit a 27 inch parachute in the model or a, or a 14 inch parachute or a 33 inch parachute, you get to choose the size of parachute that you want to make. When we go to talk about shroud line, um, you're used to probably getting something like this in your sport kits. Uh, the folds and creases or loops that are set in the line from packaging, not the manufacturer's fault. They're just doing the best they can to provide something for you. Um, those need to be relaxed out. These are also fairly thick. Uh, the example here is D size thread. Uh, it may not show up well on the camera. I'm hoping it is. Uh, this is the 100 yard spool if you were to buy something from Mud Hole. Um, if you really commit, you want to really become a, a competitor. This is what the 4,800 yard or four ounce mill spool of A size nylon looks like. This is uh, more than 200 shirt. I think it's, I think you're, I figured out that if I were making 36 inch parachutes with 12 lines and one and a half times the diameter per line, I could get 250 uh, lines out of one of these spools. And that's again around $25 to $30, depending on where you buy it from when you find it on sale. Uh, that uh, is really good if you can find the Pro Wrap brand. Now, um, I mentioned my big 30 degree triangle. I just made mine out of paper. Um, you can use a drafting triangle with 30 degrees on it. And this makes up to a 54 or 60 inch parachute, but. I uh, use that for my folding. It's just made out of cheap tag board. Important in packing my parachutes are some tools. Um, I like the cross lock tweezers to hold things. I can let go and they will hold things out of the way. You'll see that in a moment. Really fine, fine tweezers with a fine tip are great for tying knots in um, delicate shroud lines or other materials. For getting down deep inside the body tube, there are a couple of really nice things. Um, I will mention this, these are uh, for stamp collectors. I think they sell these at Hobby Lobby. They're extremely thin, flat, smooth jaws with no teeth inside. So these are uh, really nice if you wanna get inside the body tube and let go and let them slide out without dragging things backwards. The um, 
what I've done here is also trying to get deep inside large FAI style models is take a pair of the big tweezers. I think you buy these online at places like Micromark. They're long and they have some really jagged sharp teeth in here. I took a set of these and modified them. I filled the teeth with JB Weld and basically to make the inside smooth so that they won't snag my shroud lines. I also took them to a belt sander or a, a disc sander and sanded them thinner at the end. So I can get beside a parachute deep down inside a body and feed shock cord or, or retrieve something from inside and pull it back without having it pull things out of my, my, my model. Then the final magic little tool is this dowel. This is a plain old uh, 1 8 inch dowel probably hard to see, but there is a very gentle taper that's been sanded into it. It's been smoothed and doped and then um, treated with talcum powder. And in the end is a tiny notch. I also use this for feeding shock cord down beside my parachutes. Now, again, I have external parachutes. And so what I'm doing is feeding my um, shock cord down beside my parachute pack. So let's look at packing a parachute and uh, what that looks like when it's inside the body tube. We're going to start with our canopy uh, just laid out on our folding surface. I like to fold on a grid like this, and you'll see why in a moment. Um, far off in the distance, I'm going to gr grab the little knot on the end with my cross lock tweezers. And I'm going to let them provide resistance. So I'm going to lay them as far away on my work table as I can. And as I fold my lines into the parachute, this is going to provide resistance and allow it to be drawn toward me in an orderly manner. Now I'm going to make a little room here. I've uh, talking to you all. I've got a, a, a mess here on my table, but let's get this out of the way. I want to make sure to start that my lines are not twisted. So they're in a fairly orderly state and just lying beside each other, again, held in this cross lock tweezers. I'll get off screen, see if I can get a little more light on the subject here for you. Um, I don't know if that glare is gonna make it better or worse. Um, we're gonna try it. I'm gonna start by finding one shroud line. Uh, I'm working, I'm over here, so I'm gonna work it from my end. And then I'm going to grab the material between two shroud lines. For lack of a better term, I'm going to call this a gore of fabric or gore of material. I'm going to lay those two shroud lines, lining them up on top of each other. And then I'm going to get to the apex of the canopy and just draw this nice and tight. And I'm going to repeat this process, grabbing a gore and lining up a shroud line. Now, this parachute's been packed and flown a couple times, so it knows how to do it. Um, when I pull them out of, uh, after I've made them, I just store them loose in a, in a Ziploc bag with some talcum powder. I'm just gonna just methodically do this. Now this is a 12 line parachute. So I'm gonna do this 12 times, lining up the shroud lines, laying the gores out nicely. When I get all the way to the other end of my chute, we're gonna back off by half. So if I had a eight line parachute, I would back off four of these and, and you're gonna see that here in a second. Just casually, laying it all out. I'm not trying to squeeze all the air out of it. I'm not trying to get it super flat. I'm gonna lay this out like this. And like I said, I'm not kidding you. Um, I've had shoots packed for months and literally up to at least five, five years, maybe six years and still deploy fine. Um, now this is a well-talked shoot. It's been, it's been talked. I won't, won't deny that. Talcum powder is your friend, both inside and out, even though I may have ink only on the outside. That talcum powder gets spread on the inside as well. It helps uh, to seems to help knock down static electricity, which is the real enemy out here in the Southwest desert. So um, I'll say that having a helper can be nice. Uh, my wife has been on three world championship team trips with me and she is the best parachute assistant that I have. Now you'll see I've reached the end here. And so I go to pull this over. There's no reason to pull it all the way over. We'll just count this backwards. So this is number one, two, three, four, five, and six. I now have half my parachute gores on one side, half on the other. My shroud lines aren't perfect, but they're generally arranged into a nice, neat 
place and I just did what I didn't want to do and um, grabbed my, I snagged my crosslock tweezers on junk on my work surface. But um, you're going to get these laid together. Now here's where being on the gridded surface is so nice. Um, I want to come half the way up. If I wanted to, I could measure, but I, I know that halfway is about where this color separation is. I use my little marker. This could be a pencil. This could be anything. I want to remember this halfway point. I don't ever want to have any shroud line inside this shoot package above this halfway. Um, so I'm going to begin by grabbing these lines. I'm going to take them all the way up to, but just below that halfway point. I'm going to come down to some point, and I'm going to turn around and come back up again. Now, this time, I'm going to make sure I stay below the previous loop. I don't ever want this loop to get above one a previous to it because it can grab that and tangle my lines. When I come down, I'm going to go below the previous loop's bottom point. We're going to repeat this going up and down until we either run out of shroud line and, have to, uh, and we're able to stop or we run out of canopy and realize we got to do a neater job of it. Now, oh, I snagged it with my finger. Um, it doesn't matter so much for this. If this, okay, it does. You know what? I'm going to take it out. This happens all the time. You can just back up a single step or you can go all the way back. Now, to show you what's going on here, when this parachute comes out of the model, this is all going to pay out in a smooth sequence. If I were using fuzzy cotton line, this would not happen. They would snag each other and pull each other out. The smooth nylon slides out in sequence. So again, I want to get each loop a little farther down, the top of the loop, the bottom of the loop, not quite as high all the way down. So we're going to work that all the way out. Um, in the interest of time, I'll say that what I would do is then fold over the sides and make what I call the single fold. I fold my parachutes one time from top to bottom, making sure that this fold is above where the topmost shroud line is. The reason is because these thin films like Mylar and HDPE are so thin, if I have shroud line that comes around this corner, it comes around this bend, what happens is the parachute snaps open so quickly that the, that the line will bite down here inside this fold and will tend to lock this shut. So um, I know some people are in favor of a Z fold. If I had to Z fold, I would come to some lower point and I would put my shroud lines below that point. Uh, Z fold means you're gonna fold this way and then you're gonna fold back to make my parachute package. Um, very important in my opinion that you don't, uh, one, one thing I will say almost uh, guaranteed for myself failures is to make a fold and make another fold the same direction. Uh, I believe you probably can get away with some Z folds as long as you don't get shroud line up in these areas. But uh, my preference is to do a single fold. I choose the size of my parachutes by the size of the internal clean, clear volume I have in the model to make a single fold. So if I have nine inches, um, I measure how big of a parachute will have nine inches with one single fold. Um, and I'll adjust the size of the parachute up or down uh, depending on that. Now, of course, that, there are some limitations with the size of the body tube diameter. I'm gonna skip ahead and show you what this looks like with some clear BT-60. I made this just for the demonstration today to kind of represent what it would be. Now, this is a black cleaner bag parachute and I'm gonna turn off the light to knock out the glare. This simulates my external shock cord coming up and going inside the body tube next to my nose cone. Now this material, I chose a uh, thick Kevlar so you would see it on camera. I would have much thinner Kevlar and what I would want to have happen is have this lay in a series of Z folds beside themselves, not over looping like they did here until I find the very last end of it where I've cinched it down on the knot. I used the uh, pink shroud lines here and the knot is the only portion of the shroud lines that's allowed to be outside my parachute. And when this comes out of the model, 
Um, if the nose cone comes off, my parachute comes out into clean air with no cords ahead of it. Um, this all gets to come out, lay out smoothly, and then snap my parachute open. I will address one thing. Some people say that the shroud lines should be down on the end this way so that as the parachute opens, the model can pull them out cleanly. And you're going to see these just slide right out. This was packed in the exact same method. This is a much larger parachute. This is almost a meter in size. The lines keep paying out, and then the parachute unfolds and snaps open. Um, I don't think it matters whether your parachute is packed with the shroud lines backward or forward. Um, I think it's just fine as long as things come out cleanly and that you don't have a lot of congestion from the shock cord and other things getting in the way. I'm going to jump over. I only have a few minutes left, and I want to look at the Q&A. I think I answered a couple of questions online uh, or in, in my comments. Ed's asking about talcum powder or cornstarch. Now, this is one of the things that Ed and I experimented with back in 2011. When we were working out uh, how to fly half a superoctoration uh, back in 2011, when I started trying to figure this event out, it's when I was also trying out for my first uh, FAI team, we tried some, some cornstarch. It has a little bit of a tiny ball bearing kind of feel as opposed to talcum powder. If you're allergic to talc, you might get away with it. My experience is that if it gets too wet from sweat or other things, it doesn't necessarily absorb or get rid of the moisture the same way. So I have figured out through trial and error, I prefer the talc a little better. If you're hesitant to use talc, you may find a cornstarch baby powder that you might try. Um, for myself, I don't like it. It sticks to the canopy just a little too much, but that's a good question. One thing I wanted to mention is I built three parachutes in preparation for this talk. One using quarter mil mylar, one of them uh, using half inch uh, HDPE plastic. It's the black one I showed you in that demo right there. And one using the third mil HDPE. Built them identical. Um, I used the D size threads with the black one to make it a little heavier the way you might if you're just trying this out. The mylar parachute and the HDPE were uh, within a tenth of a gram of each other. Um, I think it was uh, six grams, 5.9 grams. The HTP was just a little lighter. And then the uh, thicker trash bag material, the black one of half mil HDPE, was actually a couple of grams heavier than that, that or maybe three. I think that was like a, a nine gram parachute as opposed to a six gram parachute. But um, that's all I've got for Q&A unless somebody else wants to throw things in. Um, I will try to um, answer any questions. Again, people in the competition community have such a great time doing this. We're glad to talk about the things that work. Um, I think James Duffy and Matt Steele mentioned in their talk about trying out for the world championships that are mentors listed. And um, um, that, that's a, 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 those mentors will help. Um, quick questions real quick, uh, Saviero. Oh, it's so nice to see your name. I haven't seen you in a couple of years. Uh, you can use a paper disc between the parachute and shock cord beneath the chute. I've also tried it out of really thin foam discs cut from the uh, a cheap foam paper plate. They weighed less than a tenth of a gram. And I, um, those actually work. That does work well. And I have done that. I don't do it now because most of my sh shock cord stays between the side of my parachute. Um, talc is still available. Um, I buy the great big giant pack, um, not the J and J. I buy that uh, the cheapo uh, W brand, Walmart brand. Um, Cornstarch burns. Um, I have not had that experience because my canopies get clear using a foam plug. Once I switched to foam plugs instead of wad paper wadding, I stopped with the burning issues. Um, that was just no no problem. My parachutes are flat sheets; they're not parabolic. Um, mylar. Um, when using mylar sheets, how do you keep the fold from staying folded? Mylar actually is springier. It likes to unfold better than the HDPE. Um, so I haven't had that be an issue. Um, the method I showed uh, works for both of those materials and I haven't had that. Um, let's see, anything else? Nose cone to return on your minimum. Um, how do you get the nose cone to return to your mid body? Oh, I just put it on with a loop and let it slide down. 
Um, my external parachutes are coming in through a hole in the side of my nose cone, but I've also used a little Kevlar loop on the base. Um, I see we're out of time. I hope I can answer everything there. Um, and I think I have. Thanks for listening today. It's fun. I love talking about competition rocketry. Look me up, uh, azsvs at yahoo.com. That's the trash email where all this stuff comes to. Feel free to contact me there and I'll tuck your ear off about PD. Thank you and have a great afternoon.